Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Well Said, where I interview policy experts, commentators, academics, students, and activists on topics of higher education, free speech, and other related topics for American culture and policy. You can share this episode on Facebook or YouTube, as well as any podcast platform such as Apple, Spotify, Anchor. Download the episode and listen anytime. If you like what you've heard today, give our podcast a five-star rating and go to our website, speechfirst.org, and press donate. I am very excited to welcome Aaron Cariotti to our show today. Uh, thank you so much, Aaron, for joining. Thanks, Sharice. Great to be with you. Yes. And I should mention you're Dr. Aaron Cariotti. So I want to, the reason I'm going to go through your credentials, I want our listeners to know your background, um, just because I think it's important to talk about, you know, your, not only are your credentials relevant to this fact, but it's like you were totally censored. And we you have a lot of experience of censorship and coercion um, from not only government entities, but also in academia. So I want to talk about that and tease that out a lot more. Um, so just for our, all of our listeners, Dr. Aaron Cariotti is a physician specializing in psychiatry and author of three books, including most recently, The New Abnormal, The Rise of the Biomedical Security State, uh, came out last year. He's a fellow and director of the program in bioethics and American democracy at the Ethics and Public Public Policy Center, and a senior scholar and fellow at the Brownstone Institute. He also serves as senior fellow and director of the Health and Human Flourishing Program at the Zephyr Institute and chief of medical ethics at the Unity Project. He holds the positions of scholar at the Paul Ramsey Institute, fellow at the National Catholic Bioethics Center, and serves on the advisory board for the Simon Whale Center for Political Philosophy. So as you can see, uh, very, very has a, has a very interesting background, um, very well qualified to speak on some of these issues, um, which is why we're not going to censor him here on Well Said. <laughs> Too many ridiculous titles, but yeah, thank you for <laughs> yeah. that nice introduction. No, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so let's get started because I, I, I want to talk first about your background, um, your experience with university censorship, your personal experience um, at UC Irvine, uh, and just kind of talk to you about also what was the origin of your book, kind of why did you want to write that? Um, yeah. What what was what were some of the restricting freedoms that went into um, you starting to speak out more and wanting to be have a, have a stronger voice on some of these issues? Sure. So prior to those titles that you just mentioned, I had spent my entire career in academic medicine at the University of California, Irvine. So I did my residency training there and then was on faculty for 15 years. I was a full professor, spent about half my time doing research, teaching, clinical work in the Department of Psychiatry, working with medical students and residents. And then the other half of my time, I was the director of the medical ethics program. So that was the that was sort of the main title that I had at the university. I chaired the ethics committee. I taught the required ethics courses to the medical students. Um, and I consulted on university-related ethics policies including all of our pandemic policies for the entire UC system. I was working with the office of the president, which oversaw not just UC Irvine, but all the other UCs that had, that had hospitals. And right. when I, when things started sort of going sideways for me at the university was when the university published their vaccine mandate policy and our committee at the office of the president, who was consulted on all the other COVID policies was not consulted on, that policy, which I found very, very puzzling. Hmm. It was sort of a, it just came down from on high. There was no discussion or debate. I wrote a piece in the Wall Street Journal arguing that university vaccine mandates were unethical. And I, I used that to try to prime the pump a little bit and get, get a debate going at the office of the president. And uh, that fell like a lead balloon. <laughs> and then I started, then they, they, shortly after I published that piece in the journal, they university finalized their mandate. And I started seeing people being harmed by it. Hmm. I started seeing nurses that had been there for 20, 30 years and had given very dedicated service to the patients being fired simply because they wanted to exercise their right of free and informed consent to decide whether they would accept or reject this medical intervention. I saw students and had students reaching out to me because I had taken a public stand on the issue. Students reaching out to me saying that they were basically going to be kicked out of school for their uh, refusal to consent to the vaccine. And I, I just felt that this was wrong. Mm -hmm. And I tried to project ahead uh, a few months to when I was going to teach the required ethics course, as I did every year to the med students. And imagining in you know, lecture two, where I always talked about the doctrine of informed consent, going all the way back to the Nuremberg Code, um, cent centerpiece, arguably, of 20th century medical ethics, which had just been tossed overboard by mm -hmm. these vaccine mandate policies. And, you know, I couldn't imagine 
talking about that. I couldn't imagine talking about moral courage and integrity and doing the right thing under pressure if I hadn't done that myself. If I was in a position of, you know, some degree of authority and could speak on this issue and didn't try to change a policy that was actually harming my colleagues, harming students, harming other faculty members. So I uh, made the fateful decision to challenge the vaccine mandate in federal court. And pretty much as soon as they could, after I filed the lawsuit, the university placed me on, uh, they called it investigatory leave. And then a month later, they placed me on unpaid suspension. And a month after that, they, they fired me. And so yeah, that decision, as I anticipated, it might ended up costing me my job. Mm -hmm. I don't regret doing that. I think it was the right thing to do. Um, it was a bit disoriented because I had planned to basically stick right. out my entire career at the university. I planned to retire there. This this was sort of my professional home. And so fortunately, there were some of the think tanks that you mentioned in the introduction uh, came out in support of me and gave me a home, gave me a landing pad. I was able to open up a private practice to see my patients and ended up landing on my feet. But that whole experience uh, really sort of changed my entire career tra trajectory. Mm -hmm. And the book, the, the New Abnormal, which I published last year, was in part an attempt to understand what happened to us during the pandemic and also sort of what happened to me as I was caught up in the gears of this machinery that would not brook any dissent. And, and in the course of researching that book, what I realized was that what we saw rolling out during the pandemic was sort of 20 years in the making. So I dug into the history of, of that, the militarization of public health, what I call in the, in the subtitle, the, the rise of the biomedical security state. So I mm -hmm. sort of unpack uh, the history of what led up to our COVID response. But then also make the argument that basically all that same infrastructure is still in place, just waiting for the next public health crisis. Um, and we see all around us issues that traditionally have not been considered public health issues being reframed in terms of public health and safety. I think precisely because this declaration of a public health emergency proved so useful as a, as a power grab, yeah. as a way of accruing power and the ability to make citizens, force citizens to do things that otherwise under ordinary circumstances, uh, they would never have done. So, you know, the, the book really is sort of about the future and where this whole thing may be going next. I think most people want to sort of put COVID in the rear view mirror. People, people are sick of talking about it. They're sick of thinking about it. It seems like we're sort of through the worst of it. A lot of these policies like vaccine mandates, vaccine passports, mask mandates have, you know, been rolled back in most jurisdictions. But my concern is that the whole machinery that made that possible is has not gone away. Um, all the legal mechanisms, all the, the cultural conditioning yeah. that got us to the point where we accepted these things without question. And I anticipate that we're going to see attempts to create another public health crisis, whether real or imagined, whether it's a climate and energy crisis or a computer virus crisis or some other infrastructure related crisis or another biological threat, um, that seems to be sort of our new mode of governance that permits the suspension of constitutional uh, right. rights, including the right of free speech, and empowers a kind of censorship machinery in the name of combating, you know, quote unquote, misinformation, disinformation. And yeah. uh, that that seems to be it seems to be embraced by cultural elites in both parties, to be honest. Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, I, I think they they probably have all the attempts to do any kind of like power grabbing throughout all of this, um, yeah. throughout throughout the entire existence of, of our gov governmental structures and our legal systems. Um, it was probably the most efficient and most uh, uh, adhered to attempt that we've ever seen and at least in our lifetime where they were able to create this emergency out of a virus you know there was yeah. really no information no true information really being put in front of the public it was just the information is changing daily but it i mean if they're going to look at that as an example like look at you know if i'm trying to do power grabbing in the government if i'm trying to look around and be like how can i get rid of constitutional norms how can i throw these types of things out out the window without anyone really noticing uh that was an incredibly successful attempt during covid 
Absolutely. It's, it's, I, I still have a hard time and I've spent, you know, two years thinking about it, writing about it, talking about it. I still have a hard time really wrapping my head around exactly what happened to us. It was wildly successful. I think beyond, beyond the dreams of anyone who, who used it opportunistically in that fashion, I think even our cultural elites and those who were empowered uh, by this new regime were shocked at how much they were able to, to do mm -hmm. under this declared state of emergency. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so I, that is interesting kind of thinking what is going to be the next crisis that they create, because we do know that obviously government is able to step in and consolidate power when the when the public is in any kind of mindset or turmoil of a chaos, essentially. Uh, and you, know, you see the crime rates rising nationwide. Uh, you see the drug use rising nationwide. That's right. yeah. um, and, you know, the, the flood of immigration. So there there is a lot of kind of chaotic things happening and you're kind of wondering what's going to be um, the next the next big thing to consolidate power. Um, I think the crime rates is is one that we are we're seeing the witness right now when it comes to like the legal system and how prosecutors are behaving and how um, the police officers or uh, departments are be behaving. Um, so I want to I want to kind of talk more about what happened after you left the university. So was there any was there any attempt to actually like sit down with you while you were at UC Irvine uh, and have like or did you just no. go straight into the lawsuit and they were like nope we're not having you and were you also were you tenured at the time. Yeah, I was so I was a full I was a full professor at the university and the clinical faculty at the university are not tenured, but I was as mm -hmm. secure okay. as a faculty member, you know, could have been there. And actually tenure would not have protected me in that circumstance. Mm -hmm. They they still would have uh, claimed that they could legally and justifiably fire me for alleged noncompliance with the vaccine mandate after turning down my medical exemption twice, which was signed by my physician. So the there, there were efforts on my part um, to negotiate with them, but they were in no mood to negotiate. So they had worked out deals with other faculty members that were declining the vaccine to have them work from home, for example. That opportunity was never offered to me, even though at the time, mm -hmm. about two thirds of, of my work was being done remotely, telemedicine, right. all, all the teaching, the university. This was not by my choice. The university had, had moved the teaching to remote only. And so it just so happened that, you know, I was willing to go part time. I was willing to go on sabbatical for two years right. until the pandemic was over. Um, but again, that the the accommodations that they offered to other faculty members, they were not going to offer to me. And so they used that policy as a pretense. Right. To, and it kind of fire begs, me. Yeah. And it begs the question, if if you're a conservative faculty member or even someone who's just willing to dissent. Right. Yeah. Does tenure even really matter? No. anymore? Does it really even exist for you anymore? No, no, it doesn't. They can they can create uh, policies that you one can't avoid violating without violating one's conscience mm. and then use, you know, the, wow. the alleged violation of a policy to override whatever tenure protections you might have, you know, claim that you're not fulfilling your end of a contract, which, you know, usually has some clause in there about following following all of the university policies. So whether those are DEI policies or, you know, what have you, the universities are going to find ways around tenure now. So tenure doesn't protect you. I think the only thing that, um, that ultimately is going to protect you is, uh, first of all, speaking your mind, and then second of all, uh, taking legal action when the university right. attempts to retaliate. Um, there's just a, there's a lot of fear at the university. And actually, the worst form of censorship is not the explicit um, sort of obvious and egregious forms of retaliation. Mm -hmm. The worst form of censorship at the university is simply the university climate and the, the, the sort of air that you breathe and the subtle ways in which people internalize norms and begin hmm. as a consequence of that, whether they're students, faculty, administrators, they begin to self-censor. Right. Right, right. Absolutely. And that's what we see with the students, for sure. That's 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 the real danger, um, because University of California actually has a robust free speech policy. And so if they if they do a direct attack upon your free speech rights, um, you know, you go back to this policy, which was created in the 70s, back when liberals cared about free speech um, and, uh, you know, progressives and, and classical liberals sort of had still had certain norms that mm -hmm. they shared in common. 
and uh, and you could find some degree of protection in a lot of university policies related to free speech if they do a direct sort of frontal assault on right. shut up, you're not allowed to say that, what have you. But uh, when the university climate creates a situation in which people can't say what they think, or even worse, when you go further down that road, that yeah. the questions that they should be asking simply no longer occur to people, well, yeah. then you're really then you're really in a kind of prison, the worst form of prison. And this is in fact how totalitarian regimes right. work. Yeah. So and I think this is worth spending a minute or two on. Absolutely. There, yeah. There's a 20th century political theorist named Eric Vogelin who wrote, among other things, wrote about and studied the 20th century totalitarian movements and regimes. And he said what all of the total modern totalitarian systems had in common, whether you're looking at communism, Nazism, fascism, he said it, it was it, the common feature of all totalitarian systems was not concentration camps or mass surveillance or secret police, you know, men in jackboots, as horrifying as all those things are. Mm -hmm. So the common feature of all totalitarian systems is the prohibition of questions. Right. The, the inability to ask certain questions, the inability to raise objections, the way in which speech, well, thought is policed through the policing of public speech right. is always where these regimes begin. They monopolize what counts as knowledge. They monopolize what counts as rationality. And if you raise questions, if you, if you ask any questions about, you know, the, the communist right. revolution... They don't argue with you. They don't explain why your premises are wrong or how you came they to don't engage. False right. They don't engage. They just say yeah. you're you're laboring under a false consciousness, right? So you know there's yeah. something wrong with you, and therefore you're outside of the realm of acceptable opinion. We don't need to argue with you. We're just going right. to steamroll you, right? Right? Because you're you're infected with bourgeois consciousness or Jew consciousness or whatever the right mm -hmm. wrong think might be in that yeah. regime. And, and what happens eventually, Hannah Arendt talks about this as well. As these systems advance, eventually the concentration camps and the mass surveillance and the secret police become less and less necessary. Why? Because people have internalized right. these prohibitions and, and it's not even a question to ask questions now it's not, it's even, not even a question to ask yeah. questions it doesn't even occur to people right. that things could or should be otherwise and i say that's the worst form of imprisonment because you don't even know that you're in a prison yeah no this is <laughs> uh, fascinating you i can't had... see the bars exactly right? right i had yomi park on the um on the podcast uh, a, a few weeks ago and she you was know, a North Korean dissident. She, yeah. she escaped as a child. Yep, I'm familiar um, with her work. Yeah, 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 she's great. And one of the things she mentioned was when, you know, when people ask her, when she describes her experience in North Korea and the things that she saw and it kind of coming back to that, literally no one asked questions. People was, you'd see people dying on the street and no one would even question as to why it was happening or even notice it half the time. Um, yeah. And people ask her, why, you know, why didn't people rise up? This was obviously something bad was happening. Why didn't you rise up? Why didn't you at least fight? Or why wasn't there like a secret dissenter, you know, group or something? And she said, well, the the, the reality was that they didn't even know that there was anything to rise up against. And exactly. that was like, when she said yeah. that, I was like, oh my gosh, I feel like we're in the very, very early stages of this because right. we're seeing with college students, um, and I work more with students than I do with faculty, which is, you know, why I want our listeners to hear your story too. Um, because it is happening at all levels. But yeah. when I work with students, most of what they tell me is it's, it's all self-censorship. Most of what it That's is, right. they, they mm -hmm. know, it, I, when I interview students for, whether it be for the podcast or man on the street, they'll usually look over their shoulder, see who's around. They're afraid they're going to get canceled. They are like operating in, as if they were in a surveillance state and mm -hmm. the self-censorship is running rampant. And that's, you know, that's, that's become yeah. clear. There's campuses. We, we sue universities on biased reporting systems. And these are essentially, I mean, this is literally the Stasi, you know, running around encouraging neighbors to snitch on neighbors and report each other. Um, that's right. And that's, you know, and we're, we have to defend, you know, look, the students may not be getting all reported or all being disciplined, but at the end of the day, they know this system exists. They know their peers will report on them. Uh, and so that in itself is going to create a, a sensation or a phenomenon where they are not speaking up. They're just, it's just safer to not say anything. And like mm -hmm. you said, they internalize that. 
And eventually they don't even realize they're doing it. And if you look at K through 12 to now on the university campuses, it's actually really concerning because they've been doing this their entire lives. That's right. This generation is doing right. their entire lives. They don't even know yep. what it's like to live in a really free society, which is kind of terrifying if you think about it. But No, that's exactly right. Particularly if they've gone through the public right. school system or, or many, many private schools operate. Yeah. Yeah. according to those uh, upside down norms as well. So I think that's exactly right. You're talking about years and sometimes decades of constant conditioning. And you, when the self-censorship fails, then you have student informants who mm -hmm. will snitch on you and report you to you know, whatever office of discipline and punish uh, for, for wrong thing exists on campus. And yeah, Again, and, we you know, saw this with, I mean, you saw this in Soviet communism where, right. yeah, I forget the name of this little boy who's sort of a quasi-fictional creation, but, um, you know, this young person who snitched on his parents and they were sent off to the gulags and, uh, you know, eventually murdered by Stalin. He was held up as a national hero for, you know, putting the ideology ahead of family ties. Right. And, and this is, this is what totalitarian systems do they divide people from one mm -hmm. another they isolate people from one another they create mutual distrust it becomes a pervasive climate throughout society so you don't really know who you could trust so even a student you know who uh approaches another student after class and just you know pulls them aside and says Psst, hey um i thought what the professor was saying was kind of nonsense Right. Even that feels risky right. because you're not quite sure how the, you think maybe the other person is also thinking the same thing as you, but maybe not. And if they're not, then you could be, you could be in real danger of social ostracism or worse. Um, right. So it's, it's incredibly yeah. powerful on college campuses, this whole climate. And it took me a year or two being away from the university even to realize how much I had internalized it. And I, you know, I always thought of myself as a kind of gadfly, a, a dissident voice. I was always, you know, always willing on campus to challenge convention, conventional thinking in various ways. And I had a bit of a reputation for that. And, uh, you know, even sometimes it was even well-received, but it right. took me some time away from the university to, to, you know, aerate my neurons and realize, <laughs> oh my gosh, like I'm looking over my shoulder too. And I'm self-censoring all the time as well. And I've internalized so many of these norms without even realizing it all the while thinking that I'm mm -hmm. kind of a free thinking, independent minded dissident. The, just these social forces are extraordinarily powerful. Right. And I think it's interesting um, when you talk about what happened during COVID uh, you know, we these systems, these bias reporting systems and kind of these administrative apparatchiks that kind of managed all this reporting, um, that was exacerbated and very much empowered during the COVID time. Right. So like those were the years that it already existed. Like you said, the foundation had already been built for these systems to exist. Yeah. Um, but it really wasn't until COVID where everyone felt like, wow, let's just use these. Let's report on each other. Who's not wearing masks? Who's congregating off campus? And right. it just really made the, the kind of reporting on your peers mm -hmm. apparatus really take take off. And that's what we saw with students willing to report on each other and faculty willing to report on students. That's I'm right. kind of curious um, uh, what, especially like in the medical school um, realm, you know, was there was there any kind of conversation happening um, where people weren't looking over their shoulder or, <laughs> no. <laughs> No, I mean, I had I had a few conversations here and there with colleagues about, you know, certain certain policies and, you know, the efficacy of masks. And there were certainly there were certainly a lot of physicians and nurses and others who recognized that most or much of what we were yeah. doing was incredibly stupid, non-evidence based. Um, and yet, it, you know, it was hard to get any traction in order to push back, even when we recognized it was harming patients, it was harming patient families who couldn't mm. visit, couldn't be with loved ones when they were dying. So there were pockets of resistance here and there, but but really hard to mount anything that would actually meaningfully challenge these policies. And COVID was also very effective at creating external markers of compliance and obedience, which you know that always drives the censors crazy that they can't actually get inside your head. 
Hmm. So silence is a kind of dissent. I can, you know, I, yeah. or defense, I can sit in class and think whatever I want, just so long as I don't open my mouth. Well, right. you know, the, the people that want totalizing control that drives them to distraction. So, hmm. so now we have external markers, like, you know, pull your mask up over your nose sorts of things um, that can kind of externally manifest uh various levels of of obedience and right think and group think and so forth. And um, I, I think that's one of the reasons that mass became so powerful and so necessary. And actually many mm -hmm. public health officials admitted at certain points that they recognized that masks were not effective at stopping transmission. Right, I remember that, yeah. But they were useful at basically inducing compliance and providing an external marker of who was and who wasn't a good citizen. Uh, so, yeah. Well, let's talk about so in the medical schools because you mentioned something about um, I think it's in your book and you probably talked about it in other places as well. Um, kind of this expansion of the definition of public health. Yeah. And how uh, basically to include social justice and yeah. and all of these various DEI diversity, equity, and inclusion type initiatives. Um, talk to us about what that looks like in medical schools and what they're pushing ideologically yeah. in medical schools, but, and what that is going to potentially do to the medical field. Yeah. Because, you know, we talk about how this is kind of not, what happens on campus isn't gonna stay on campus. We kind of acknowledge that at this point, you know, all this DEI stuff, we're seeing it kind of go into the tech community. We're seeing it in the corporate community. But what's it going to look like in the medical community? Because this is at the, now this is like life or death at this point. So yeah, that's um, right. What, how is this going to impact it? So I'll mention two laws in the state of California that are impacting medicine. One is Assembly Bill 2098, mm -hmm. which I and four other physicians are challenging in federal court. I think we're going to win the lawsuit. But this is basically a bill that empowers the state medical board to discipline and potentially remove the license of any physician who in the consulting room, in the one-on-one -on -one doctor patient relationship says anything that would contradict the quote unquote current scientific consensus on COVID, which is of course never defined in the law. It's a legally vague term. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's not clear uh, how one would ascertain even what the current scientific consensus is on ever evolving information and on, uh, you know, issues of ongoing debate. Mm -hmm. But um, we're challenging that on First Amendment and 14th Amendment grounds. We got an injunction against the law while the case is being tried, which is a very good sign that the court is kind of indicating that our arguments are strong. So I think we're going to prevail there. But this was a trial balloon to mm -hmm. see how much speech in the privacy of the consulting room yeah. the government could control, basically. And the medical board um, is made up of 15 people, only half of whom are physicians, many of whom are lawyers. One of them is yeah. a, is a, I think like an executive coach or something like that. These are not people that are competent at reading and understanding the scientific literature. Uh, they're all appointed by the governor. So they're very easily p politicized. Right. Yeah. Um, this is a really naked uh, power grab to try yeah. to control medicine. There's another law that was passed in California that says whenever, so Physicians have to do continuing medical education training. And, um, you know, if you get a training module or a lecture approved for CME, there's certain criteria that you have to basically follow uh, in, in, in that. So this law would basically require every time uh, someone uh, gives a lecture or a case presentation or whatever for continuing uh, medical education, they have to talk about health disparities and basically the law frames it such that you have to basically blame the health disparities on the implicit bias of physicians, right? So if there's differences in health outcomes mm -hmm. between blacks or Hispanics or whites or whatever on hypertension or heart attacks or whatever, if I'm talking about um, cardiac issues, I not only have to highlight those health disparities, which might be a reasonable thing to do, that's an important issue. But then I have to attribute them to the fact that doctors must be racist, right? That's the mm. only way to account for them. First of all, there's no empirical evidence for that. Right. And second of all, there's a huge mountain of empirical evidence basically showing that those health disparities are mostly due to social and economic factors, right? right? Which we should actually be trying to address 
right? So the, the fact that California has failed on their public policies in addressing poverty, in addressing disparate access to healthcare, in addressing all of these problems um, that they claim to care about, this is basically, okay, we're going to offload the okay. consequences of that <laughs> onto physicians, all right? The real problem is that physicians are, you know, implicitly biased, i.e. racist, without realizing that they are. And um, so it's a really, it's a really sort of nefarious shift of responsibility, right. uh, you know, onto uh, for enormously complex problems. I'm not suggesting that the government of California is also responsible for all these things. Obviously, there's very complex historical, cultural, uh, economic, all of, all of these dynamic factors uh, yeah. that make but these the actually blame... really, really hard problems, yeah. with, which would require like lots of different efforts. On Certainly, but the government to has, to, to, has to bear some of the blame. And so they're trying to Absolutely. shift it completely off. You yeah, just saw right. that. I think it was San Francisco spent like $6 million on an ad campaign trying to get tourists to come to San Francisco rather than spending that money on maybe getting rid of like, like clean up the people city off the street and, or cleaning up the city or, yeah. I mean, 20 years ago, San Francisco was a beautiful city. I mean, just a yeah. gorgeous, yeah. wonderful place to go. Um, I, and now it's it's a I don't know if I can curse on this episode. I mean it's a it's a it's a it's, it's, it's a crap yeah, hole. It is. Um, as as is Los Angeles and mm -hmm. Seattle, a city I grew up near, where I still have family. But Seattle is just a, an amazing city. Twenty years ago, yeah. And you can't walk around downtown in any of these places anymore. Right. And and you know civilized civilized countries. Um, I was just talking to Michael Schellenberger, who ran for governor. Uh, last week about this, um, talking to him last week. He didn't run for governor last week. <laughs> that was uh, a short campaign, yeah. <laughs> it, and, you know, he was he basically pointing out, because he's been working on this whole issue of homelessness, he's mm. been basically pointing out that you don't see these kind of open-air drug scenes. You don't see these tent cities in any European cities, in any mm -hmm. European country, because they bring... The, First of all, they recognize that homelessness is not a housing problem primarily. Mm -hmm. It's a chronic and severe mental illness and an addiction problem. Right. Um, and that actually requires caring, admitting that mental illness is real, right? And so the ACLU's talk about quote unquote patients' rights basically mm. denies that, you know, someone can have severe schizophrenia and be completely delusional and actually society has some responsibility for trying to take care of that person and get them into treatment, even if they're a little bit treatment resistant. Um, but, you know, bringing the, these people in off the streets, getting them the help that they need right. rather than just building housing. And then we wonder why they destroy the housing and they actually don't want to live there. Um, right. You know, well, just, just like the safety measures too, compared to other countries. I mean, America is supposed to be, you know, not only are we supposed to be supposedly the most powerful and successful country in the world, and uh, but we're also, you know, we are a first world country. And the fact that you can't really visit any of our major cities without yeah. being worried about being held up by at gunpoint, being assaulted, yeah. being harassed. I mean, this is something that yeah. It's why this is something you would expect if you told your daughter or something, you don't want them to visit certain towns, maybe. And like, maybe yeah. you don't want them to go to Cape Town in South Africa or something because of the crime rates there. But why would you be telling them that about America? That's something that really is crazy. We should, we should be ashamed of. Um, and it Abs should, Absolutely. You know. I, I've got a, I've got a friend who just spent a year in Budapest kind of studying the Hungarian government. I, I don't really want to get into debates about <laughs> Orban, or, you know, right, right, like right. whether this is a model for conservatives to follow or whatever. But he said something that really struck me because he moved his whole family there. And this is, you know, it's a major European city, very populous, uh, very dense. Mm -hmm. He said his wife would be entirely comfortable going out alone at night, riding the subway and going literally anywhere in the city. She would feel safe. And there's no city in the United States where, no. you know, she would feel comfortable doing that. And it just it just really struck me that, wow, this is actually possible. I mean, societies do create conditions right. in which citizens feel safe. 
that that's not an unreasonable right. expectation. And we didn't used to always be like this. We've regressed. Yeah, it used to right. be that. I mean, I, I remember my first when I first started working in Washington, D.C., I, I would take the metro all sorts of places uh-huh. without being concerned. And before this goes too far down the path of crime issues, we'll, we'll get back to the free speech. Yeah, I think uh, we need to get back stuff. to it. Yeah, but I'm, I'm, I'm now I won't take the metro at all because I can't yeah. go on the metro without being harassed um, by someone who's like asking me for money. And then when I say no, I get screamed at. So yeah. it's <laughs> that's that's the regular norm now on the metro system. Um, but jumping back to medical schools, because also, especially with with the field that you work in, of psychiatry, uh, there's there's a lot of coercion happening here um, with yep. with um, professionals, but also students. And one thing that we're concerned about is a level of coercion going on in in um, in the schools. In that, you know, with the DEI, the diversity, equity, inclusion initiatives, pushing uh, students to ex- essentially acknowledge what you a lot of what you've kind of just talked about, where they have to acknowledge most of this stuff is. Um, has to do with systemic racism or right. institute how everything's been systematized to to kind of disadvantage individuals, but also kind of forcing them to do certain maybe certain medical rotations at an mm-hmm. abortion clinic or right. at, in transgender surgery, uh, right. you know things that maybe that goes against their fundamental beliefs, but now they have to satisfy this requirement. Um, so talk a little bit about yeah. what you've seen in your field, um, especially with the coercion in the medical school specifically. Yeah. So this is, thank you for bringing this up. This, this conscience rights of medical trainees is very, very important issue. And I think there's a lot of medical students and residents that don't realize that federal law prohibits the medical school from forcing them to cooperate with, assist on Hmm. any procedure that uh, violates their conscience or their religious convictions. And that would include you know, anything from abortions to, for some students, uh, prescription of contraception uh, or sterilization procedures to um, gender, so-called gender affirming care Mm -hmm. uh, or gender transition medications or surgeries. That students have the legal right under federal law with the Hyde Amendment, the Church Amendment, um, to opt out of any of those procedures. And if a school tries to force them to do those procedures, that hospital could lose federal funding, including Medicare funding, which all hospitals rely on. Now, right. the the current challenge and the current administration with this is that the arm of the federal government that is supposed to respond to complaints in this regard, and then basically be responsible for enforcement of these laws is the Office of Civil Rights and the Department of Health and Human Services, which formerly was run by my friend and colleague, Roger Severino, who was doing a terrific job of defending conscience rights of students, nurses, doctors, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And now um, he and I are both worried that if you file a complaint to the Office of Civil Rights, it might just sort of drop into the black hole of their complaint box and never be heard from again. So students should know on the one hand that their legal rights are being violated. Uh, They should file an Office of Civil Rights and OCR complaint, but they may also want to reach out to one of the legal nonprofits like the Alliance Defending Freedom or the Beckett Fund Mm -hmm. who are focused on uh, religious liberty and conscience rights for some legal help they may need a letter actually from a lawyer saying you know what you're doing is violating federal law and yeah the the schools absolutely would respond to something like that um but students have to know their rights and of course it takes a lot of moral courage to try to defend one's rights and try to try to stand up for one's rights because there's this power hierarchy and students just want to get through and they're worried about their grades so right. on and so yeah. forth. So I understand all of the challenges that students may be facing, but uh, federal law still protects still, them. Yeah, still on uh, their side. But like many laws, you know, they may have to they may have to flex a little bit uh, to indicate that they're w- right. open and, there and are willing to take legal action. It's not yeah. as clean cut all the time either. So you know, the rotational stuff may be more obvious, but 
the what's the white coat ceremonies where they have to take oaths. I've been seeing them yeah. uh, put various phrasings in those in those oaths that they have to take, or the waivers for MCATs for minor underrepresented minorities um, to get into institutions. You're kind of like now it's a pass fail MCAT instead of an actual score. I could have a doctor who barely passes MCAT. Uh, you know, it's a, or yeah. not may may not have taken it at all. Uh, so this is something that I think is a huge public health concern uh, with with this level of le leniency and implementation of some of this DEI stuff that is much more muddied and kind of gray area than what the students could even identify. Yeah. 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 I mean, I would ask most people, including racial minorities, would you rather have a physician who went through training and advanced based on merit and ability mm -hmm. Right. Or a physician who went through an advance based on any other, you know, any other criteria, right. um, you know, you're about you're about to be wheeled back into surgery, and uh, you know, which surgeon do you want? Right? right, they're about to put you under anesthesia. Which right. anesthesiologist do you want in that operating room? I think you'll get the same answer from pretty much everyone. All right, so let's talk more about um, this this t term. I don't know if you've coined it. I, I like the term. We're going to use it in the title for this episode. Uh, censorship industrial complex, because yeah. this kind of encapsulates everything that I've been working with on the yeah. university level. But then when we're trying to talk about it and characterize how it has infiltrated everything from, you know, from the university to the government to HR departments to corporate, you know, everything. So you're talking about censorship industrial complex. Can you define what you mean by yeah. this um, and kind of go into go into what what you're seeing uh, in, in that realm? Yeah. So to give credit uh, where credit is due, the term was coined by Michael Schellenberger, my, okay. my journalist okay. friend, who's done some work on this in the context of the Twitter files. Many of your listeners may be sort of familiar with some of the stories that have come when Elon Musk opened up. Uh, the internal communications at Twitter to some journalists. Mm -hmm. And one of the stories that came out of that um, had to do with the fact that not only was sort of Twitter censoring users and what they could and couldn't say, which everyone knew and was perfectly aware of, but they were often doing it under pressure from the federal government. And <clears throat> I and a few other people already knew about that because before okay. there were the Twitter files, there was the uh, the case in federal court known as Missouri v. Biden. So this was the right. state attorney general of Missouri and Louisiana filed a suit against the Biden administration a year ago. Uh, there are currently four, uh, actually, I think there are five now private plaintiffs, including myself, uh, my colleagues, Jay Bhattacharya and Martin Koldorf, who are two other physician scientists who were censored during the COVID pandemic. And what we're alleging is that the federal government has been pressuring and colluding with social media companies right. to censor uh, speech. And arguably, and people can get into debates about Section 230 and federal law and what private social media companies should and shouldn't be allowed to do. Um, and those debates are interesting, but inarguably, nobody doubts that the federal government cannot engage in censorship. And that's exactly what they have been doing. So there's about a dozen federal agencies named among the defendants in our suit now. So there are many federal agencies that we've discovered have been involved in censorship. We can talk about SISA, the, the sort of probably right. the centerpiece of the censorship industrial complex at the federal level, but the FBI, the DOJ, the State Department, uh, recent documents that we uncovered on Discovery suggested that the Department of Treasury was involved in censorship, right? So if you criticize the U.S. monetary policy or the feds or you know raise questions about the stability of our banking system, mm -hmm. you know, you were engaged in wrong think that was undermining trust in the government. The Census Bureau apparently has been involved in censorship. And I'm digging into that story to figure out what's wow. been going on with the <laughs> Census Bureau, but That's like, disconcerting. places that you yeah. never would have imagined. Yeah. Um, not just the intelligence agencies, not just the Homeland Security agencies, not just the public health agencies like CDC and NIH, um, but treasuries, Census Bureau, what the mm -hmm. heck is going on here? Um, right. And basically a lot of the censorship work is outsourced to um, universities and private nonprofits. Well, allegedly private, they're all government funded. And there's mm -hmm. this kind of rotating, revolving door of basically yeah. the people involved going from government to these 
uh, quasi-private government-funded entities uh, that are doing a lot of the censorship work on the ground to social media companies and, and back. So it's very incestuous. But when when Schellenberger calls it a censorship industrial complex, the, the word industry should be taken absolutely literally. It is a full-blown yes. 24-7 industry of people flagging posts, uh, communicating with social media companies, Twitter, Facebook, Meta, Google, YouTube, so forth, so on and so forth. And um, working around the clock, there are training institutions and mm -hmm. career opportunities within the industry. So it, it really is a fully developed industry. The industry started getting going, sort of the history of this thing started uh, around 2016, actually in, in the wake of the election of Trump and in the wake of Brexit, the, the, the mm -hmm. uh, Great Britain voting to exit from the European Union. Basically, our elites decided that, yeah, democracy is all fine and well, but we have to protect democracy from populism, <laughs> from uh, from the populace, from the demos, uh, the yeah. people, right? Um, <laughs> by making sure that, you know, the people always make the decisions that we want them to make, which requires that we that we censor and control the flow of this is like the tyranny of the technocrats, right? Like they are experts, exactly. so they have to maintain being experts and everyone is exactly. to them for answers, right? Just just so. So they they turn their attention around 2017 to well, they call it, you know, controlling disinformation. But that was, you know, that's a euphemism for basically for censorship. And I mentioned CISA, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency. This was stood up in the waning days of the Obama administration in 2016. And it was allegedly tasked with, with protecting our digital infrastructure against cybersecurity threats, you know, computer viruses, mm -hmm. external attacks, and that, that sort of thing. Around 2017, Jen Easterly, who was the head of CISA, decided that part of their mission, part of the remit, of that agency was also to protect our cognitive, which he called our cognitive infrastructure from threats, both external yeah. and internal. How do they even foreign define and cognitive? Yeah. So you, you <laughs> our listeners are probably wondering, well, what is our cognitive infrastructure? So Sharif, our, our cognitive infrastructure is the thoughts inside your head. Our cognitive <laughs> so infrastructure is the thoughts yeah. inside, you, you know, our <laughs> listeners heads. Yeah. Right. And that, those, those, that cognitive infrastructure, your thoughts need to be protected from bad ideas, right? And which bad ideas? Well, the, the ones that pe the people at SISA and their, their partners mm -hmm. decided were bad ideas. So they very quickly wow. turned their attention to censorship. And the same pivot happened with several other federal agencies. So we have federal agencies that are allowed to do things to foreign nationals that they can't do, that would be unconstitutional to do to U.S. citizens, so the the federal government, right or wrong, can censor information coming from Russia or wherever, right? Mm -hmm. But they can't censor information coming from American citizens. But you know, it's just when we're trying to censor information on social media, it, it gets too complicated to try to figure out right. was this account foreign or domestic. So we'll just kind of all lump them in together and treat them the same, which is an obvious First Amendment constitutional violation when you capture anyone who's sharing information as an American citizen. So Certainly. lots of agencies yeah. got involved, you know, always in the name of health and safety and protecting us, right? Which is mm -hmm. always the excuse for censorship. It is for your own good. And there's right. ideas out there that are so dangerous that we just can't let them surface and we can't we can't have them shared on social media. And the censorship regime was so detailed it wasn't just kind of pressuring social media companies to take down this kind of content but it was you know a senior official in the white house uh i wrote a, put, a piece in the wall street journal about this a guy named rob flaherty basically harassing badgering and abusing a senior executive at twitter saying why hasn't this account been taken down why hasn't this tweet you know critical of the president's policies been taken down People very, very high up here in the White House, you know what that means, are very, very unhappy with your company, right? So, I mean, they, the social media companies have so much money. They're not, you know, they're not that mm -hmm. worried about their customers or their advertisers. They're, what they're really worried about is uh, 
constrictions on their power. And the only the only the only people that can constrict their power are the lawmakers that can make make their life difficult. And people in Congress have threatened to remove Section 230 protections, which spell the end of these corporations if these corporations didn't play ball and do more censorship. Um, and so, so it's all been very explicit, mm -hmm. all been very egregious. And the private plaintiffs in the case um, were censored for content mostly related to criticizing COVID pandemic policies. But as we've uncovered more and more documents on discovery and taken de depositions and so forth, basically we've discovered that COVID was only one among many things that this censorship industry was targeting, right? Wow. So anything from election integrity, you know, so some Joe wow. Blow sitting yeah. on his toilet tweeting, I don't <laughs> know about these Dominion voting machines, without knowing it is <laughs> right. being censored. Um, you know, the tweet is shadow banned or whatever. You don't mm -hmm. necessarily know when you're being censored. The algorithm just tweaks things so right. that you can put something out there, but nobody actually sees it or it's not able to be shared or what have you. Um, they were censoring what could be shared on WhatsApp, which is supposedly a private text messaging application and, and encrypted. And so they may not be able to see the text that you write, but they can see links that you share. And those mm -hmm. links were limited if they were wrong think articles, you know, something Cariati wrote. Um, wow. that we don't want passed around mm -hmm. on uh, even on a text messaging app. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, gender ideology, abortion, um, there, there's a long list. Of, the usual suspect of like yeah, off-limit topics. Exactly. I go, whenever and, I talk to students, I said, what topics are off-limits in mm -hmm. class? Like, what can you not talk about without worrying someone's going to report you for. And it's usually these these ones, right? You can't talk about race. You can't talk about gender ideology. You can't talk about immigration or abortion. Um, just kind of yeah. all off And Somehow the yeah. censorship always moved in the same right. political or ideological direction, funny enough. Yeah, funny um, enough. That's so interesting. I mean, the censor I feel like this could be like kind of a scary story that kids tell around a campfire, the, the, the censorship industrial complex. Like this is terrifying. What you just laid out here is... And in, it's not just a private entity. I mean, this is like an entire, like you said, administrative yeah. system that's designed to to censor and coerce thought. Um, and it's it's so ingrained in in our in our administration and in the way that our federal government operates in yeah. our tech communities. Like, how do you even walk any of this back? How do you kind of un unplug some of this? Yeah. So we we just filed in our case a request for a preliminary preliminary injunction, mm -hmm. um, which would uh, be a big warning shot across the bow if it's granted. Okay. I think it may be granted. The judge seemed um, very open to our arguments last week in when we were doing the oral arguments in court. And the evidence that we've uncovered already on, on limited discovery, there's going to be more discovery when we go to trial, but on limited discovery, yeah. we have incredible and and shocking evidence of what is going on. And if we get this injunction, basically the court will be uh, will be saying that uh, any federal officials that are involved in this will basically need to stop communicating with one another. Um, mm -hmm. And because all of those communications can be subpoenaed by the court. And then, wow. you know, people who are who are continuing to communicate with social media, about uh, censorship could be subjected to more severe legal pen penalties, including you know jail time. So I think the first step is to break up the communication network with which an injunction from a federal court um, can't stop completely, can't stop what people say to one another at the water cooler, but at least electronic communications will be very limited at that point. Uh, we need to continue uncovering the anatomy of this whole yeah. Leviathan. Yeah. Um, so our case is doing some of that work. The Twitter files were helpful. There's some investigative journalists, Matt Taibbi and, and others who are continuing to dig into this stuff. And uh, Mike Bence at the Foundation for Freedom yeah. Online has been looking at this for years. Actually, he was way ahead of the curve hmm. on this stuff. His research is enormously helpful. So we have to, we have to know... The, the enemy, we have to know and understand the nature of the problem and how it's functioning and how it's working. And then we need to find the legal points of attack. And, you know, the greatest defense is that First Amendment of our right. Constitution. 
I think this will be the first of hopefully many cases. We recently converted it to a class action lawsuit, which means uh, I, as a plaintiff in the case, am representing not just myself, but anyone si similarly situated. So I feel a sense of responsibility, not just, you know, to to get justice for the fact that I was unjustly censored um, by social media during the pandemic. And that may have, you know, caused harm, but also that many of my fellow Americans who don't have a microphone, who don't have right. you know, a public voice were also censored and their rights are every bit as important as my rights are. And, you know, they may not have the, the, the legal power or the ability uh, to advocate for this on their own behalf. So we're we're now advocating for all Americans, basically. And I say all Americans, even, even Americans who uh, don't post things on social media are affected by this. The Supreme right. Court in previous cases, this is a very important point about free speech. Um, the Supreme Court has made clear in previous First Amendment free speech cases that the right of free speech exists not just for the speaker, it exists also for the listener because people who go on Facebook or Twitter or, I don't know, share articles with friends on WhatsApp. Well, now the uh, news covers Twitter. I mean, everything that's exactly. on social media it, is in the news anyway. It, it drives, all of this yeah. drives journalism. So yeah, mm -hmm. even if you're just watching yeah. evening news, it's downstream of what's going on on Twitter. Exactly, right. And, and Americans have the right to hear both sides of a debate. So what we right. got during COVID was the false projection of a scientific consensus where there was no scientific consensus on lockdowns, on masking, on vaccine mandates. It's just that one side of those debates was entirely suppressed and silenced by the censorship regime. Um, and and um, Amer the Americans who have the right to hear both sides of debated issues in order to make informed decisions were harmed by the censorship regime, even if they've never posted anything on social media. Right. That's one of the reasons this issue is so important. That's one of the reasons it's so important on campus, right, yeah. to have meaningful discussion and debate on campus about um political or social issues. I mean, the whole point is to seek truth, right? Exactly. And that's, at the end of the day, you can't seek truth without having a discussion or trying to be intellectually curious about something or, or any kind of debate or pushing back on each other, having people push back on you. Um, and it is it's it is really sad to see that the discussion and free inquiry and all of that have basically been eliminated from campuses. Um, from what I can tell, students and faculty alike, they don't, they don't actually hold debates or open discussions yeah. in the classroom anymore. From, yeah, like, that's right. The, the place, the place where debates on these issues right. should be happening. I mean, the university should be the the first place that one can go for robust engagement, discussion, debate, um, and and deliberation on issues of public import. And right, right now, it's the last place where those right. things are welcomed. I mean, it's so it, upside it down. Is. Yeah. Um, and it's it's the universities have gone so far off the rails that not only are they failing to achieve mm -hmm. their mission, but they're they're the biggest hindrance to yeah. uh, free and open inquiry. They've uh, so I think they've they've done a, a good job accepting their role in this censorship industrial complex by oh, training a doubt. Fu yeah future yeah. training up training future activists who are going to continue to censor through whatever career field that they go into. That's to Two of the key players in the censorship industrial complex are Stanford University and the University of Washington, who both have yeah. censorship outfits that are deeply embedded with uh, the government, with uh, with SISA and the other agencies wow. that are censoring. So the Stanford Internet Observatory, and I'm forgetting the name of the outfit at the University of Washington, um, who, yeah, again, just funded by you know funded by the same players including the government it's That's it's all very it it becomes actually hard to distinguish mm -hmm. between the state actors and the private players because they, they end up they end up going like this which the court has also made clear in previous cases right. that uh that's that's a violation of the first amendment so yeah the government's sure. only defense is that you know we're just being helpful we're just we're just giving the social media companies information and they do what they want with it. We're like, hey, by the way, this might violate your terms of service. And by the way, we think you should change your terms of service um, if it doesn't violate them. I, there's that going on too. Um, and then they they can take it or leave it. First of all, that's not what's happening. We have lots of evidence that there's like berating and coercion and threats of regulation and all the rest wow. of it. But even if even if the overt stuff wasn't happening, 
the courts have made it clear that these forms of entanglements and enmeshments also constitute state action. Right. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I go into it in details. Uh, one of my Substack posts talk about the sort of five different ways yeah. um, that the government can engage in state action on free speech. And basically, we have evidence in our case that they're doing all five of those things. Um, so this is, you know, you always like to think that something you're involved in is of, you know, world historical importance. But I, I'm not the only one who says this. Other people who yeah. are following this case, you know, credible journalists have have said this could be the most important free speech case of the last 50 years. Absolutely. And the, re yeah. the reason is in, in prior cases where the government got entangled in censorship and was slapped down by the court. It was typically one publisher or one author, or one article or series of articles or one source that they were mm -hmm. trying to suppress. Mm -hmm. What we're talking about here is hundreds of thousands of ordinary Americans being censored tens of millions of times. Right. That's I mean, just the scope and the, you know, yeah. because of the new digital landscape, right. obviously right. censorship on this scale was never possible you know, before the age of social media. So being the first case of this kind in the age of social media, the, just the, the vast reach of this Leviathan is n like nothing that we've ever seen before and dealt with in the legal landscape. And that's, I think that's one of the reasons that, that this case is so important because the, the power of the government uh, when it comes to censorship now simply dwarfs anything that the government would have been capable of, even with the best of technologies 20 years ago. Yeah. And I think that's what's it's so important that our listeners um, who are passionate and interested in free speech issues going on around the country and in higher ed um, follow you and the work that you're doing. Um, what's your sub stack called? What's it under? Yeah. So it's called Human Flourishing, um, aaroncariotti.substack.com. You can uh, just go straight to the URL. I'm on Twitter at a Cariotti. And um, I've got a piece coming out. Uh, well, I've written, I've written, written on Missouri v. Biden many times. You could find it on my Substack, and the stuff that was printed in Wall Street Journal and elsewhere is reprinted on my Substack. I've got a piece coming out in Talent Magazine on Sunday with an update on the case. Right. Um, and so, yeah, you there's we'll there's other people around. following the case. Tracy Benz uh, is a good follow on Twitter. She's done a terrific job. Uh, as a journalist of, of digging down. And if re if you really want to get down into the weeds okay. on what's happening legally, you know, if you're, if you're a lot nerd, uh, Tracy's a great follow on Twitter as well. And if there's, so as, as folks are following this case and kind of following you and your work and what's going on, what, uh, what else can our listeners do? What else can students do? Do you have any advice or recommendations? Yeah. I mean, start phone? talking about this issue um, mm -hmm. and start, start bringing, start, you know, asking inconvenient questions. First of all, do you know that the government is engaged in censorship, right? Do you think the government should be engaged in censorship? How would that square with our constitutional rights? I mean, start raising these questions, start challenging people, start asking these questions. Although the government is not involved in censorship. Oh, okay. Well, here's an article you might want to read. This is actually hard evidence, you know, quoting emails and communications between the government and the social media companies, demonstrating that the government is doing this? What are, are you surprised? You know, do you think this is okay? Um, this is an issue that I, I would hope um, even the most ideologically divergent students could find some sort of agreement on free speech. I mean, if we can't right. find agreement on free speech, this is what I keep saying. I don't know how this became a partisan I mean, issue. I, you know, I, I have no uh, idea how free speech became a partisan issue. Like this yeah. is <laughs> this is supposed yeah. to be a universal issue well, in the United States. It, it's about you know, it's about power. Really, yeah. um, and yeah. when you have when you have when you have a stranglehold on you know certain institutions, whether it's you know the media, uh, the the administrative state, you know you may not have a stranglehold mm -hmm. on the legislature uh, or the courts entirely uh, or the the executive branch, but um, but you can lock down the administrative state, you can lock down most of the media, you can lock down certainly higher education. Right. And you're in power. Right. Well, you don't want challenges yeah. to that power. Uh, it would be more convenient just to place people outside the realm of rational debate and conversation and steamroll Certainly. them rather than having to engage with their 
ideas or have your own ideology challenged in any way. And so, you know, when, when you're in power, censorship can look very attractive as a way to maintain your power and do an end run around anyone who would potentially challenge. Well, especially if you consider yourself benevolent and yeah, you know, obviously. These, these, like benevolent dictator types, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm the enlightened one. Right, and, right. You know, exactly. These dangerous ideas are going to harm people. Right. So you can always frame it in terms of danger and harm. And, um, and you know, our, our elites have really developed an incredible level of condescension mm -hmm. toward the average oh, American, absolutely. Absolutely. right? Who doesn't know what's best for him or her self, um, needs to be told what to think, needs to be told what to do, uh, even coerced to do the right thing. We saw plenty of that during the pandemic um, on threat of being fired or kicked mm -hmm. out of school. Uh, you're going to do this, whether you want to or not, whether right. you think you need it or not, whether you think it's going to harm you or not. Um, and, you know, this is this is how power operates. Right. And the the people who wrote you know, the men who wrote our Constitution right. understood something about that. Uh, there's no such thing as a perfect Constitution, but ours has proven to be pretty darn good. Um, and. Uh, and they they understood how power operates, and our constitutional order is an attempt to place a check on mm -hmm. uh, raw power, right? And on the on the consolidation of power. Um, but there's always social forces that are working against that, and the constitution remains a dead letter if people are not willing to defend it. So I'm hoping Missouri v. Biden will open the breach, and other people who have been censored can file lawsuits trying to. Um, you know, extract damages from the government uh, based on the harms Absolutely. that they suffered uh, at the hands of the censorship regime. Um, but at this stage, start certainly start talking about it. Uh, you know, if there's folks out there that want to contribute to these legal efforts, uh, the new Civil Liberties Alliance, NCLA, is the legal outfit that is uh, representing the private plaintiffs. Obviously, the state attorney general uh, mm -hmm. is representing the states of Missouri and Louisiana. Um, so NCLA is a great organization doing legal work in this domain. Um, I have no official connection to them, so I'm just, you know, <laughs> that's not one uh, of your titles. You don't have one of those. No, no, I don't. I, I don't. They've, they've, they've helped me out in this lawsuit and actually they're representing the doctors in the lawsuit in California that I mentioned ah, earlier, yeah. where mm -hmm. the, the gag order on physicians that were challenging yeah. in federal court, NCLA is doing the legal work on that as well. Yeah, they do a so, lot of good work. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, there's there's organizations out there that you can engage with and in, you can get involved in and, you know, contribute to if you're in a position to do that. But I think the most important thing is to talk to people. And, mm -hmm. you know, something all Americans can do is to try to start recognizing when we are self-censoring. Yeah. And start to push back against that, start to take some risks because that that kind of cowardice is contagious, but courage is also contagious. And what I've found, and Absolutely. what many other people have found, is like if you're if you're in a group of six, eight people, and it looks like groupthink, and nobody's raising questions, and you raise questions, sometimes one or two other people will come out of the woodworks and say, "Yeah, you know, I I agree with with Aaron on that on that point. I'm with him." And you've you've empowered, you know, you're the first one through the wall always gets bloody. To quote mm -hmm. uh, Moneyball, one of my favorite movies. Uh, but that empowers other people to do the same. And so start taking risks in that regard. Recognize when you are self-censoring. Obviously, there's prudence. It doesn't mean you say, say every thought that comes into your head all the time in every social situation, right? Use discretion, use prudence. Um, you know, maybe this is not a hill that you want to die on socially or whatever. Um, but uh, But also recognize, okay, there may be situations in which I need to be a little bit more daring. And if yeah. more and more Americans just started doing this, if more and more students, if 5% of the students on campus yeah. started making a little more noise and pushing back, there would be change, right? That's be, all it would yeah. take. Because when you take the percentage of those who are keeping their heads down and you compare that to those who are screaming and rioting on campus, I mean, they make up, the ones who are screaming and rioting are a very, very small percentage of the students that, right. the, that the administrators are trying That's to right. appease. So if you, yeah, like you said, it really would only take 5%, maybe even mm -hmm. less than that of the students um, uh, yeah. who want to speak up and defend their rights. Absolutely. Mm -hmm.
Um, well, thank you everyone for joining us today. We're going to have to stop it there, but you've given us so much to think about. There's a lot that we covered here. I feel like each topic that we discussed, we could do its own podcast episode on. Um, but thank you so much, Aaron, for joining us. I'm Sharice Trump and everyone that was well said. <laughs>